Fasting versus caloric restriction. It's this constant fight, this constant battle, and it's happening more and more online. The fasting community claims that fasting is superior to caloric restriction. The caloric restriction is simply saying, no, it all comes right down to caloric restriction. Well, it's not that easy for either side, really. And when we look at really an unbiased approach on it, it's difficult. We have to analyze the data. But the bottom line is that fasting is caloric restriction. And I know there's these two camps and they fight each other all the time, but come on, when we are fasting, we are restricting calories, okay, period. Does it mean that fasting comes with additional benefits? I wouldn't even say additional benefits. It comes with possible different benefits. Some of the benefits of caloric restriction are the same benefits that come with intermittent fasting. Because some things are a very clear switch that's either on or off if you're in a caloric deficit or not. The primary benefits that are coming from fasting over caloric restriction are probably the fact that fasting can be used as an acute stressor to be a hormetic stressor. Caloric restriction is still a stress to the body, but we've all done those diets or done those things before where when we start something new, we get immense success. It's kind of a phenomenon. We don't know every detail with it, but when we start something new, we get a success with it. We need to keep fasting close to our chest and use it as a tool so it continues to be an anomaly and a stressor. Because the moment that we start fasting every single day, not that there's anything wrong with it really, it really is just caloric restriction. You're taking the glory out of it. You are just, in essence, making it a different form of caloric restriction. But I ask of you, I beg of you, why? Why is it such a big deal to just like something? I was 110 pounds overweight. Okay, I was way heavier than I am now. I was obese. I was depressed. I hated my life. The point is, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but fasting saved my life. But that doesn't mean that it's better than everything else. But let's get down and break down the data because that's what this channel's about. It's about science. If you were to do 16 hour fasts every single day, you would probably have immense benefit. But you're not fasting long enough to really get a whole lot of the fasting specific benefits. So in essence, you really are just doing your own form of caloric restriction. But again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because there's similar benefits. Psychologically, if it's working for you, it's working for you. Nothing else worked for this guy, for me, except when I started fasting, because psychologically it worked for me. Anyhow, I'm gonna get off my high horse there. Let's get back to the data. A lot of the benefit from fasting comes from the fact that it is an acute stressor and it triggers what's called a hormetic stress within the body. This triggers more resiliency, can potentially make cells stronger, things like that. But it needs to be acute. It needs to happen every once in a while. So that's why I'm personally a fan of like fasting a couple days per week with slightly longer fasts. So let's look at the data when it comes down to metabolic markers, because there's a really interesting study that was published in the British Journal of Nutrition. This study took a look at 115 overweight people and it put them on a 25% caloric deficit, but they divided them into two groups. So one group did daily energy restriction where they ate 75% of their necessary calories. So they were in a 25% deficit every day. The other group, two days out of the week, only ate 30% of their necessary calories. So a 70% deficit. So significant deficit there. Okay, they also had them low carb. What they found was pretty interesting. Now, you might be wondering, this is not fasting, right? But there's a point to that. So both groups ended the study at a collective 25% deficit. They just got there two different ways. One group was at a 25% deficit every day, and the other group was doing two more extreme deficit days. Not fasting, but extreme deficit days. Well, the group that was doing the extreme deficit days ended up having more fat loss. They also ended up having more insulin sensitivity. And the reason that I say this is twofold. It sort of implies that when we are fasting or when we are restricting calories aggressively, the benefits are sort of like a dimmer switch. So maybe a slight deficit gets us a little bit of a benefit, and the more that we crank up the deficit knob, the more benefit that we get. 
So one could argue that fasting is such an extreme deficit that you're cranking that dimmer all the way. And that's a pretty valid argument, but it also does not deny the fact that we are still dealing with caloric restriction. And these benefits, although possibly attenuated by how much of a deficit we're in, are still initiated by a deficit. It's very interesting, but it also could imply that fasting maybe is an easier way to get there. But at the end of the day, you still need enough calories to survive. So if you're not eating enough to survive, then it's not going to work at all. So you kind of end up at a wash and you have to do what works for you. Okay, you're kind of annoyed now because Thomas isn't taking one particular side. Okay, let's keep going. What about benefits that occur independent of weight loss? Okay, this is what we have to look at because when the calories discussion comes in with weight loss, that's where the tribes fight. But maybe there's different benefits outside of that. There was a study that was published in the journal Cell Metabolism. Okay, this one was interesting because it took a look at early time-restricted feeding. So intermittent fasting where they ended eating by 3 p.m., dinner no later than 3 p.m. And they compared that to a 12-hour eating window, which is still great. I love a 12-hour eating window. So early time-restricted feeding versus 12-hour block of like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Well, they found some interesting stuff. They found that the early time-restricted feeding group ended up having improved beta cell function, improved insulin sensitivity. They ended up having improvements in reactive oxygen species scavenging ability. They were able to neutralize free radicals better. They had improvements in postprandial insulin levels, and they also had a little bit more weight loss. Well, the interesting thing with this is this could largely have to do with the time of day in which they were eating. One thing we have seen from a lot of data is that eating at night is not good when it comes down to weight loss. So perhaps just by squeezing their eating window into an earlier part of the day, they were better off. Well, does that mean you need to go change your eating window so you're eating in the morning? Not necessarily. Here's my point in saying this. It could simply be that the period of time in which we are exposed to a deficit or the period of time in which we are exposed to fasting, what time of the day we are fasting could actually play a big role in the specific benefits that we garner, right? So both groups had improvements in those markers. The early time-restricted feeding group just seemed to have more improvements. But over the long term, maybe things would start to wash out. I still rest my case with the fact that intermittent fasting works better for some people than it does for others. And some people try it and they can't stand it. Some people try it, like me, and it's the only thing that really worked for them. And I resonate with that. But then we talk about muscle mass, and there was an interesting study published in the journal Obesity Reviews. Okay, this was wild because we have to factor in how much muscle we retain because that really demonstrates our metabolic rate. This study took a look at caloric restriction, regular caloric restriction versus alternate day fasting. They found in this study that the loss of fat-free mass, the loss of muscle, was quite a bit higher in the caloric restriction group versus the alternate day fasting group. Why could this be? This is because fasting is being used in a little bit more of an anomaly fashion. Okay, I'm not against fasting in a 16-8 fashion every day. I usually steer people away from it, but I like to think, like I mentioned before, that you start to kill some of the benefit of doing it because it should be a shock because most of the benefit, if you ask me, comes as a stressor and a shock. Alternate day fasting allowed for longer, more intense fasts, less frequently, thereby introducing more ketones into the bloodstream through a longer fast. Ketones are well documented as being pretty muscle sparing. They spare glucose in the body and they also spare leucine, which is a very pro-growth anabolic amino. So that could be the reason there, although that specific study did not detail that. But then we need to look at some data surrounding like ketone production and all of that. Now, can you produce ketones and get that benefit without actually fasting? Yes. If you deprive yourself of carbohydrates, you can produce ketones. If you're in enough of a deficit, even if you're not fasting, you can absolutely produce ketones. Fasting isn't for everyone. Some people like to do different things. One of the things that I do recommend people do if they want to do longer fasts and they don't want to go without eating altogether is try a bone broth fast. You still get to have something come in your body, you still get to kind of satisfy the brain a little bit, and you keep yourself satiated, and you're really still getting a lot of the same caloric 
deficit benefits of a fast, maybe not as much in the way of autophagy, but you're getting that caloric deficit that you want. I put a link down below for Kettle and Fire, that's the bone broth that I use. And even if you are not doing a bone broth fast, even if it's just for breaking a fast, bone broth is really good simply because it's easier on the gut, okay? You take it in, it's nice to digest, it doesn't feel like you're bringing a bunch of food in when your stomach's really sensitive. That's one thing everyone can agree on. At the end of a fast, things can just get, it's hard. It's like you eat something and you're like, uh, oh, I'm bloated, I don't feel too great. Starting with some bone broth can help kind of repair that gut mucosal layer a little bit more, help bring some of that collagen and some of that gelatin into the colon a little bit more. So you're kind of repairing that and introducing something before you bring food back into the system. They also have regenerative forms, so they have really good quality stuff. Okay, you have beef, you can have chicken, they have different kinds of bone broth. So again, that link is down below in the description and you can save a few bucks because you're watching this video using that link down there. Now let's talk about ketone formation for just a second because there was a study published in Cell Metabolism that looked at fasting and ketones. Now I know not everyone that is looking to do fasting is trying to achieve a state of ketosis. I understand that. But really, to get the benefits above and beyond caloric restriction, you need to introduce longer fasts to be able to have ketones present. Because then you have an argument and you have a different discussion on not just thermodynamics, but something that is additive, the presence of ketones. And that opens up a whole new discussion because of course there's different benefits there. Because now you have a different molecule, you have beta-hydroxybutyrate present, which is now certainly a different discussion from just caloric restriction. Okay, now the reason I mentioned this study is because this study found that when subjects were fasting compared to a control diet, they had significantly higher levels of ketones and they were significantly higher at the end of a fast. Kind of a no-brainer, but it needs to be said with some data, and there we go. So the reason that I mention this is because, at least from a metabolic side of things, ketones seem to preserve muscle. There was a study that was published in the journal Metabolic Syndrome. Okay, this was interesting because it took a look at a higher carb diet that was a deficit compared to a keto diet that was a deficit. Okay, both groups lost weight, but the keto diet seemed to retain fat-free mass, skeletal muscle better than the control diet. So what's the potential mechanism here? Well, with this, we have to look at two mechanisms. For one, when ketones are present, they provide the brain with an alternative fuel source. So therefore, glucose doesn't need to go to the brain as much, and that glucose can now be shuttled around to skeletal muscle tissue, keeping it active, okay? So that is very, very important. Now, another piece of the equation is that ketones are leucine sparing, and leucine is an amino acid that is known as the anabolic amino acid. It triggers an mTOR response that retains muscle or helps muscle be built. So by having that amino preserved, we potentially keep more muscle on us. The interesting thing about this particular study is these were in individuals that were not weight training. I would argue that someone that is in a caloric deficit that is having carbs, okay, that is not necessarily producing ketones, if they weight train, they will probably preserve just as much muscle as someone that was doing keto and weight training. But this is just very interesting to demonstrate how protective they can be in individuals that aren't exercising. Pretty cool stuff. Now the big discussion comes up surrounding autophagy. And I get a little frustrated sometimes because autophagy is a very cool thing, a really cool thing. But where I get frustrated is that it gets waved around like this autophagy flag, like it's only exclusive to fasting. It's not. Does fasting get you there faster? Possibly because you're not eating and you just flip that switch very quick. So possibly you're entering that autophagic flux quicker. But we do have to remember that caloric restriction and fasting both induce autophagy. The question comes to be, what is more sustainable? And that's where I feel like fasting is a more sustainable way of putting yourself into that autophagic flux. There was a study that was published in the journal Cell Metabolism that went into this in pretty good detail and ultimately found that when you compared alternate day fasting to caloric restriction, this was a large study, alternate day fasting was more sustainable. And subjects even mentioned that they would be able to continue with their alternate day fasting protocol better than they would be able to with caloric restriction. This is not to say that caloric restriction is bad. It's to say that again, it all depends on the individual. For me, 
I cannot stand just being in a deficit all the time. It's miserable to me. I am a very black and white off on guy. For me, fasting is a better way for me to induce autophagy because I'm flipping that switch. But make no mistake, caloric restriction is going to trigger autophagy too. I just think you might get a slightly stronger, there's not a lot of data on this, I might get a slightly stronger response with autophagy because you're getting there faster, okay? But you're also having the ketones present that are sparing muscle, and that could have a positive impact on autophagy as well. Not to mention mitophagy, which is the autophagy that's very specific to the mitochondria. So what is the end breakdown of this? Both caloric restriction and intermittent fasting work. They both work in parallel ways with very similar mechanisms. Where they differ, intermittent fasting works better for people that are psychologically wired that way to do better. Intermittent fasting works better when it comes down to being combined with a lower carb protocol because you're getting the benefits of the ketones. Okay, where does caloric restriction come into play? Who is that better for? That's better for people that maybe feel like they need consistent food throughout the day. Or maybe that's better for people that are just wired that way. If they don't feel like they can munch on something throughout the day or have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner without you know, feeling hypoglycemic or feeling foggy, then that's for them. And there's probably different benefits that come from that. Maybe with caloric restriction, you're having continual spikes in mTOR that might allow you to maintain muscle mass for longer. Who knows? But there are different benefits. They're not the same. They're not apples to apples. It's apples to oranges with the same common denominator being they're both fruit, if that makes sense. I'll see you tomorrow.